Hello, welcome to Adapt Enclose Review, a place of knowledge packed and commonly tested information on the enclose. Today, I'm going to talk about the dreaded enclose cranial nerve um, that most students hate. Um, when I was in medical school, um, we all don't like reading about cranial nerve, but I will, I will try and make it easy for you today easy way to memorize it and understand it and um, how to apply it. We also will talk about the two or three of the most testable portion of the cranial nerve, like trigeminal neuralgia and a bell palsy. So I hope um, you get some, something out of this. Um, let's get to it. So cranial nerve, um, most of the cranial nerves um, for four out of the, they control four out of the five senses and um, the, the visceral organs of the body. So they're very important. Um, the senses I'm talking about, as you can see, is the smell, um, um, smelling and your sight, your taste and your hearing. There's a lot of cranial nerves involved in this particular uh, area. There's few that involve uh, in a visceral sensation, they're giving information to the brain uh, for the brain um, to be able to see what is going on and then function appropriately. So, and four of them usually involve in these senses, um, in four of your senses. The, the, um, the, the, these cranial nerves are located at the back of the brain, and um, I will draw an example. You don't need to know um, anatomical relationship, but it's good to see what usually goes on at the back of the brain like that. You have the brain stem here, and the, with this control, you're breathing. So this is the brain stem. And the nerves comes at the back. One, the first one usually start from me, it's like, it's right here, the olfactory, and then there's another nerve um, over here, cranial nerve start from here, another one come from here, so this is one, two, three, then there's four, tiny four, and five is the biggest one among all of them. Um, five is like here, and it has three branches, and then six to 12, um usually at the lower back and so they start from here to the bilateral another one start from here this may be seven then eight nine ten eleven and twelve so they are all at the back of it and they number it in order so if they give you a, ch a chart this has to be one two three four five six seven eight nine ten you don't need to know too much of the anatomical relationship, uh, but you just know that this these nerves sensing information to the brain to tell us about to tell the brain about test, uh, your orientation, balancing, your hearing, your sight, uh, your swallowing. Um, so they control some portion of the visceral. That's why I say four out of your senses are all controlled um, uh, by that because there's no um, cranial nerve that involve in touch. Okay, so touch is the last sense. Uh, so you're touching, um, it, it's not actually cranial nerve function. Somebody can touch you and you can feel it, but you touching doesn't involve any of the cranial nerve. Um, so this is just a summary. And then, so you see how important these nerves are. That's why they can test you in your question, in your, uh, um, in your exams. So this is this slide is the problem. How do you remember them? Well, the the, the first one in, in cranial nerve one is called olfactory. Cranial nerve two is optic nerve. Cranial nerve three is oculomotor. Four trichlore. Five is trigeminal. Six is abducens, seven is a facial nerve, eight is a vestibulocochlear, nine is glossopharyngeal, ten 
Vegas. This is Vegas. Um, Vegas. Um, 11 accessory nav and 12 hypoglossal nav. Some of the names can give you a clue about what its function. But the best way to remember, it, you have to have your own acronym. There's a bunch of acronyms. But when I was in medical school, there's one that I like very much. So it's like O, O, O. So there's three O's, right? And to take a family vacation. Go Vegas, Vegas after hours. There is so many mnemonic you can make your home that is more comfortable so that you can remember it. Um, but you you have to figure out some way to the the order because it helps you focus. You know, this is some of the things you have to memorize. There's no way you can re reproduce it. Um, some people can do that. But this is what I did when I was in medical school. So they, if you go to the, um, everybody have the oh, mnemonic, but mine was oh 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 three to take a family vacation, go Vegas after hours. So that's the way you can. So the O is olfactory. Another O is optic. Um. The third O is Oklo Moro, then Tokyo and Trigemina. You see, there's two T's, but you have to like picture it in your brain to like brain can take it. You have you can remember a few of them, like five. You know, because there's two T's, I remember five is always trigeminal. You know? So the other T has to be trochre. Uh, because there's a bunch of O's. I remember the first O is olfactory and the third O is oculomoto. So I don't remember the, because there's three O's, I pick and choose. So if one is olfactory and the third is oculomoto, then two has to optic. And the two T, if the five is trigeminal, the other T has to be four. Um, and then eight and, nine, um, and 10. I know they all have V, vestibular cochlea, and then um, Vegas, so vacation and uh, and 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 then uh, Vegas, right? Vegas and Vegas. So I know that ten is common. Vegas nerve. So the other one has to be vestibular cochlear. So this is how you can remember them easily. So oh oh oh, to take a family vacation, go Vegas after hours. And if you know the order. You have to apply once again. I'm coming back to pathophysiology that will help you the function. And so, um, there's another mnemonic that you have to know what it does. The olfactory is it a motor because it's cranial nerve, they can be a motor function or sensory function or both. So there's another mnemonic that you have to know. Is olfactory a sensory or a motor or it does both? So the other one is some say what? Marry money. Then you stop. Or some say you should marry money. You're marrying somebody money. But there's a bad day. Okay, my brother, so my brother, what is my brother? He says, what does he say? Big brain matters most. So these two, I can remember all the credit and what it does. So the other one say, some say you should marry somebody for his money. But my brother said, well, don't do that. 
you should marry them and they should make sure big brain they should have a big brain matters most so some say marry money but my brother says big brain matters most so if you want to marry somebody you have to marry somebody with a big brain so what he means is the first one some is sensory s second one optic is a sensory um uh, oculomoto is m so it's a modal function trochlea is also modal function trigeminal is b so it's both it's sensory and modal abducens is modal facial nerve is what b so he has modal my brother so he has both modal function and sensory function vestibular cochlear is sensory glossopharyngeal is b so it's both Vegas is also B, both modal and sensory. Accessory is just modal. And um, glossopharyngeal is modal. So, oh, 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 to take a family vacation, go Vegas after hours. Then to know what your function is, some say marry, marry. But my brother says big brain matter most. After you've done that, you know every, you know that they have function, you know they have function, you know your sensory and that. And therefore, you can see what is the actual function. Now we're talking about the function. You, you're going to talk about the function instead. I'm going to talk about the function now. So function function of the nerves. We know they can be sensory. We know they can be both. So olfactory, what does it do? Well, that is your smell. This is what you can smell. So dirty stuff, the best way to remember is factory. Factories sometimes smell. So <laughs> olfactory, smell. So the involving smell. Then optic, this is always confusing. Two and three is a visual acuity. Visual acuity. So your visual acuity is what optic nerve two or visual field. That's what number two does, right? Then number three, which is oculomoto. You see there's moto, something is moving, something. You know, optic is always your eyes. So something, your visual acuity. Oculomoto, something is moving. So it's involving high movement. I'll use EM as high movement, but the main function is what? Your pupilla function. So pupilla reflex and everything, you're looking for oculomotor function. So high movement, your highest movement and the, uh, your pupillary function. So that involving your pupillary function. Then for, um, you know it's a model because it's an M, at least your eyes movement. But how does they move the eyes? I mean, it's, I don't, this one is not that important, but it brings the eyes together. So a deduction. So when you look down, you're looking down, it's bringing those two eyes together. Your eyes try to cross each other. So that's how you do that. Five is the biggest. It's a trigeminal, so it's both. It has a motor and sensory function. So the motor function is your chewing. When you're chewing, you're using trigeminal nerve. And then the, your face, sensation. So facial sensation. So the, the, your face, to be able to feel your face is because of the trigeminal nerve. So it has two functions. You chew and your face function. Six is another extraocular motor movement. So that's EM, extraocular movement. That means it moves your eyes. Um, but how does it move your eyes? It moves the eyes, move them away from each other. So lateral movement. So abduction. So they move away. Um, four, uh, uh, four, bring them together, adduction. So you can look down, and when you look laterally, is the six that they all help with the high movement and seven um seven is facial expression so like 
when you're smiling to facial expression and blinking your eyes. Um, these are all involved. Um, it's both. So he has modal sensei. Uh, he, he, he has modal and then uh, um, at the same time and uh, sensory function. So when you do that, all this movement and the uh, sensation of your oral cavity also is involved. Um, then vestibular cochlea, you can see vestibular cochlea. Whenever you see vestibular function, they're talking about balance. So this involved with balance and your hearing. So when you're hearing something, yeah, that's what is involved. Grossopharyngeal, that's the one they, they always like to ask. They ask, like to ask five, seven, and nine because they are very important structures and we see it all the time. Grossopharyngeal is cranial nerve nine and that is gag. So when a patient has stroke, we worry about the grossopharyngeal function. Uh, gag, reflex, and they are swallowing. Uh, they are swallowing well. The vagus is also involved in swallowing and your speech. Okay, so it helps with the speech, the vagus nerve. So it has both motor and sensory function. Accessory is mostly a motor function. Uh, um, and that's how when you shrug your shoulder or you turn your head left to right, you're using your accessory or sp uh, spinal nerve, accessory spinal nerve. So shrug your shoulder or turn your head back and forth. Um, and the glossopharyngeal is for tongue movement. Tongue movement. So you got to figure out to remember these functions by using um, some say merimari, and you can see if it's a motor or sensory function. And then when you know this, the nerves and what they do, when they ask you a question, they're just trying to figure out if you recognize that our cranial nerve two is involved with visual acuity rather than cranial nerve three, which is involved with eye movement and preparatory reflex. And therefore, how do you test them? This is where they will, they will, they, they will like to trick you at. What kind of test would you do? Okay, to find out that somebody has olfactory dysfunction. Well, let them smell something. Give them a rotting something. Let them close their eyes and smell it. And they will tell you whether it, it tastes like this or that. It, it smells like this or that. I mean, if they cannot smell anything at all, that means it's bad. So let them smell something. Give them something bad and tell them how does it smell like. You know, does it smell like orange, banana, or something like that? And optic, like you tell you, sometimes some people get confused about the function of the optic nerve. They, comp they, they confuse it with the oculomotor uh, nerves. Uh, but what this does is a visual acuity in uh, and, and your field. So this is where you do snell and test. You let them read the chart. Let them read the chart to see the 2020 function. So this is what you're doing when you're doing that cranial nerve two. Cranial nerve T three is what you do all the time. It's for eye movement and pupillary reflex. When you're seeing the patient, well, I'll write it and you'll see it. That's it. People equal reactive dilability. So that is what you're doing. Um, So the cranial nerve three, this is what you do. You do the parallel, basically the people, people equal around reactive to light and accommodation. So that's what you're testing. So this is what you test when you're doing that. You're signing the light, the pen light in front of the people and see whether you constrict how big it is and what it does. Um, we, we've talked about the abducens. Basically, you take the pen light and then you direct it in front of the eyes and then let them do, you, you move the pen light downward without, and let them look at it without moving their head. So this is the um, pen light test and for extraocular movement and you're looking for downward movement of the eyes. They should, they should come together. Try germinal 
And the name trigeminal, you can see, is tri. So it's something three. And uh, I will draw it easily. We'll talk about it later. So trigeminal, there's three branches. If this is the nerve, there's one going to the, the optic area, there's one going to the maxillary, and one going to the mandibular. So there's three um, areas, and it has both sensory and motor um, function. So to test this, let the patient chew. It's involved in chewing. Um, let them chew and then touch their face and let them close their eyes and see if they can tell you which portion of the face you're touching. You know, so you are, that's how you can assess. So uh, uh, testing uh, basically sensation of the face. Okay, you touch the face and to ask them which portion of the face you're touching and let them chew. A due sense is the same thing. Let them move. You take the pen light and you move the pen light away and let them ask you how far they can. I mean, let them move the eye. You can look for the movement of the eye as you move the uh, pen light away from the middle. And then you should see the, the eyes move away. So they move laterally. So lateral movement of the eye. So A, B, action. And how do you test for um, facial, which involve in facial expression? What do you tell the patient to do? Um, what do you think? Um, because it's created under seven and facial expression, the best way we can see your facial expression is smile. Let the patient smile and see, or close their eyes because it's involved in your eyelid movement. Let them close their eyes um, and then let, ask them to frown, okay? If they cannot do that, then the facial nerve um, may be dysfunctional. Um, the facial nerve may be dysfunctional. It has both motor and sensory. So um, let them smile, close their eyes, and then let them frown. And then vestibular oculo, how do you test it? Well, you have to test for balance. This you should know because they like asking it. What are the several ways you can test and patient and balance. Well, there's a different way. You can do the heel to toe test. So you let them walk, um, walking heel to toe. They put, plant one leg on the floor and put another one, one run right in front of the, the, the heel to the toe with their eyes closed and then and see if they can, or no, with their eyes open and see if they can do that. They can also do here to shin. So they, they take one and heel and then run it onto the other shin all the way down and see if they can do that. If they do that without falling, that's good. Then you can let them do super, supination and pronation of their hand. So let them flap their hand back and forth and turning front back, front back, Without, if they're able to do that without falling, then that's a good, um, and they have a good balance. Um, then you, 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 you let them touch your, your finger and touch their nose back and forth, back and forth um, without any problem. That's good. It's testing vestibular cochlear function um, of the, the, of the, the cranial nerve eight. And of course, gag reflex, which is, uh, uh, we already talked about is cranial nerve nine. Um, the, the easy way to let them say, ah, okay. You can see the palate, there's and a soft palate moving. Um, and that can give you an idea of whether the brusopharyngeal is doing its job. They say, ah, and the soft palate mood. And you can also test for the uh, gag reflex. Only, you have to put something on the back of your throat if they will gag. So that's creating the nine. 10, which is Vegas, and Vegas is, is Vegas, is you. Vegas um, is involved in swallowing. So let them swallow and let them say something. Speech um, is also um, out of test. And uh, we talk about the accessory nerve, let them stride your shoulder and turn your head back and forth. Cranial nerve 
12, pay attention. Um, this kind of sometimes it confused pay, uh, uh, students. It's involved in tongue movement. Okay. So you have a big tongue like that. And this is one side. This is another side. So if this is the left and this is the right, if the right side is affected, so right side cranial nerve is affected, you have two for each. So if this is affected, you would think, oh, this is the now become stronger side. And so this pull away the, the uh, weaker side away. But unfortunately, that's not what happened. To test the atom, the acranial nerve to have function, let them uh, open their mouth and, and pull out their tongue and let them move it left to right, up and down, left to right, mostly left to right. The side that is affected is weak, but when they move their tongue left to right, it will deviate towards the weak side. This is a testable point. So if you have right-sided glossopharyngeal nerve, no, hypoglossial, hypoglossial nerve injury, so if you have cranial nerve 12 right-sided injury, the tongue will go towards the right, the weaker side, because the stronger side is too strong, is of a pattern such that he now he deviates, he puts yourself towards the right side. So remember when you have um, cranial nerve 12 injury, the tongue will move towards the injury side. So that's the key point you should pay attention. And to test it, let them pull out their tongue and let them uh, move it from left to right or stick it out. And then the weaker side, will you will see the tongue deviating towards that side. So this is basically summary of all the cranial nerve um, and function and what it does and what you do, how to find them and how to remember, remember them. Um, and I know it's very intimidating, but if you sit down, write them down and you try to put the, your names together, you'll be able to figure out what they do. Now we'll talk about specific ones that they like to test. I mean, they like testing. Um, people who have laryngectomy, so if you have laryngeal cancer, okay? Laryngeal cancer. If you have laryngeal cancer and you have laryngectomy, what it means is removal of your larynx, okay? That removal of the larynx, the cranial nerve, nine is near that area, okay? It get injured because it's involved in swallowing. It starts from the back of the brain and go all the way to the larynx and the vagus. They pass through that area. And so if this is the larynx, the nerves come and supply some of the vocal cord and the uh, area surrounding up on top of the vocal cord and your swallowing mechanism, they are all there. So when they get injured, during laryngectomy, removal of your larynx um, is a problem. Patient will have problem swallowing and the agag reflex will be a problem. And then the effect if aspiration, so that's airway issue. So any patient who have stroke or have any surgery affecting their larynx who have a breathing problem, and that can affect, uh, um, no, it will have a swallowing problem and that can affect their airway. So be careful, those patients, you need to prioritize them. These patients, because of their swallowing will be affected, they need to see a speech pathologists to find out what kind of food will be best for them. Do, it, do they eat? Pure food, do they eat um, soft diet, uh, clear liquid? Of course, you know, they can't drink clear, clear liquid, but that's bad. You want something that is thicker so that they don't aspirate from it. And so they will need something we call supraglottic swallowing. 
Um, and so they, they have to be taught how to do supragrotic uh, swallowing. This is a testable point you should know. What does that mean to do supragrotic swallowing? Because they have cranial nerve in eye injury and they have swallowing problem, either from laryngectomy or stroke or anything like that. So first, uh, what a speech pathologist would do is teach them to take a, a deep inhalation. So inhale deep, deeply. So they take a deep breath, okay? Then after they do that, they hold that breath. Hold that breath. Then what do they do? They place the food in their mouth. Place food in their mouth. And then swallow while you're holding your breath. So breath is still held. So they inhale deeply, they hold their breath, place their food in your mouth, swallow by holding their breath at the same time. Right? Then when they finish the food pass, they should cough. Cough to so that they, whatever fluid will be, a food will be left in the, the vocal cord area will be gone. And then you tell them, swallow again. Swallow the second time. Second time. So that's what you do. And uh, you teach a patient who have uh, lar uh, laryngectomy or they have cranial and they have nine injury. You teach them to do supraglottic swallowing. So it is swallowing above the super uh, the, the uh, glottic area, and this is preventing them from having aspirating. So they take they inhale deeply, hold their breath, put the food in their mouth quickly, swallow, then cough. After they do swallow, then let them swallow again so that they can get rid of the and the food. And these are all they need to do is to prevent aspiration. And as you can see, this is very important for a patient who have, have stroke or um, have uh, glossopharyngeal nerve so injury. So patient who had laryngectomy, when they give you a question, just be careful, look at it, and that is where they're trying to lead it to. It's a speech pathology evaluation who will tell them what you do if they have they give you a stroke patient the same thing now this is another good area they like to ask you trigeminal neuralgia i told you the trigeminal nerve um if this is your face the 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 trigeminal nerve is three branches. One go here in the optic where your eyes is located. One go the jaw, uh, your jaw, but the one above and the one go below. So that's why it's called trigeminal. And it's one nerve. So it's trigeminal, it's three nerves. Sometimes this nerve can be affected. And when it's affected either to uh, injury or anything like that on most of the time unknown, okay, idiopathic. So idiopathic cause of trigeminal neuralgia. That means um, injury to the cranial nerves fall. So most of the time is unknown. I'm a pathophysiology guy. So there's inflammation of the nerve. Whenever the nerve gets inflamed, it's going to fire like crazy. And when it fire, it's going to fire towards the distribution of the nerve. Okay, this is where the nerve going. So wherever the nerve is going, it's going to go there. And we already talked about the function of the trigeminal uh, nerve, um, which we already know is uh, both. It has sensory and motor function. Therefore, you should uh, sign some symptoms. What you expect the patient to present is both motor function and sensory function, right? They will have, usually is a sudden onset. So sudden onset or acute onset, it just happened. 
you have two of the nerves. If one side is affected, it's no guarantee that the other, other side will be affected. So usually they are unilateral, so one side, just one side. Um, I've never seen bilateral trigeminal neuralgia. It's painful. And they, they have pain, and the pain is what they like to test you. So the pain looks like electric shock. So when you see electric shock pain, or it can be burning pain, okay? And it's usually what? Severe, severe kind of pain, severe pain. This is severe probing, or another word, throbbing, throbbing, burning, electric shock kind of pain on one side of the face, nonstop. And think about it. Now we know what the, 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 the nerve, where it goes, where it functions. So what do you think can trigger this? So what do you think will be a trigger for this? And before that, we already know what the trigeminal does. It's involved in sensation. So sensation of the face. You see, I'm using my pathophysiology. And it's also involving chewing. So mastication because of the jaw. Therefore, how would I trigger it? Well, if you attach my face, I rub my face, I massage my face, well, it's going to be bad. So massaging, rubbing. I'm basically triggering the nerve um, and then it will start firing more. So if you have trigeminal neuralgia and you massage your face or um, uh, rubbing your face, is going to make the pain really worse. Or if you wash your face really hard, washing your face is a problem. You basically, you're rubbing your face, your hand in your face, triggering the nerve, which is a sensory nerve in your face from the ophthalmologic area to the maxillary area. What else can trigger it? Because it involved in what chewing, what is the the upper molar, the maxillary and mandibular. Well, if you chewing, it is going to make worse. What else do you do with your teeth when you brush your teeth? Brushing your teeth will make the disease worse. What else do you do with your jaw? The two jaw, the upper and lower jaw. What else usually naturally you do? You yawn, yawning. All these things can trigger um, the trigeminal nerve and let it fire. Last thing, what do you do with those jaws? When you talk, you open them. So talking. So maybe you got to be talking. Uh, you got to stop talking, trigeminal neuralgia. So as you open your mouth and you start talking, if you have trigeminal neuralgia, you start firing and it's hot. The, the nerve get mad because he doesn't want to do his job anymore. You see what I've done? I've used the function, an idea, and the location to come up with so many symptoms and triggering. And this is what they will ask you. This is what they can put it there because they, they want you to understand it. That's how the patient will present. So they put those signs and symptoms, triggering, all this thing, I put in a SATA question form. And uh, all my work I try to do in a SATA because that's the most intimidating. But SATA is just, SATA questions are just risk factors, education, management, pathophysiology, all come down under pathophysiology. So if you study that way, it will make things easier for you to understand. And so you see what I've done? I've arranged them in the way it's supposed to, using what I know and based on pathophysiology. Now, I know the how it present. I know what is the trigger. Well, what is the treatment? First, what uh, uh, if it happened? So you know the how it happened, which distribution is involved, what can trigger it? Well, treatment. There can be so many treatments. Education and teaching. What do you tell the patient? I'm going to use 
the same thing we've done over here. I'm going to bring this and change it into education and teaching. The same thing. If they brush their teeth, his head, it, it, the pain get worse. So what do you tell them? Well, use a soft brush. It's, I made it easy. If you're brushing your teeth, it's going to hurt. So you should use a soft brush that um is not that it will not irritating or just a restored uh, brush. Okay. What else you do? Look at it. What we have. Well, don't massage your face. No massaging. Don't massage your face. What else? Well, the 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 chewing is a problem. So you want them the if they're going to eat, they shouldn't chew on the affected side. So no chew on the affected side. On affected side. Regarding the chewing, you don't want them to eat anything that is too hot and too cold. So avoid extreme temperatures. So that means they shouldn't eat something that is too cold or something that is too warm. So it should be like in a normal um, temperature. We are still on the chewing. If I'm chewing and talking, that is making it hard. Well, if I have to chew, I should have something soft. I, have to, I don't have to chew hard. You see, I've given you easy SATA question that you can teach the patient. When they chew and they talk, it gets worse because they're moving the maxillary and mandibular bone and the cranial nerve that is involved causes the problem. So don't chew on the affected side. Um, you should avoid uh, some food that will make you chew for a long time. So eat some soft food. Okay, and hydrate yourself. It's better to have clear something liquid. Um, and then you know, don't eat any cold or hot food that will stimulate the, uh, the nerve and make it worse. If you touch your face, it's going to hurt because the nerve is involved in sensation. Don't massage your face. Don't brush your teeth too hard. And so you just use a soft brush. So these are the teaching you teach them using the same thing we've talked about, the trigger. Massaging, washing face, chewing, brushing face, yawning, and talking. It's the same thing. I can use so many words for it. I'm not doing anything. I'm just coming to the point that this trigeminal nerve is a sensory and motor uh, cranial nerve. And the function of the nerve is sensation of the face and chewing, and therefore, Everything has to come from these two things. Okay, now medical management. They are in pain. It's electric shock like burning, severe pain in their face. Remember, I just want to caveat this is never a priority patient. Never choose this patient, they will trick you. They say it's a patient with trigeminal neuralgia with sharp, sudden, or said painful um, face, or when chewing, well, it's an expected finding, expected finding. It's not in my B sharp. Check my prioritization uh, video. So it's unexpected. Having burning sensation in your face when you're chewing from a trigeminal neuralgia, is an expected finding, it's never. But we have to treat them anyway. So they are in pain, this stabbing pain, this electric shock pain, 
shock-like pain, this burning pain need to be treated. They need medication. And mostly pain medication. It's a nerve, nerve pain. Every time you have a question with the nerve pain, try multi, multi modal pain management. What it means is that means you're giving them NSAID, you're giving them anti inflammatory like NSAID, you're giving them like Tylenol. You're giving them antipsychotic or antidepressant medication that have pain um, and neurological control that can involve in pain management, like TCA. So that's what I mean, TCA. They can use to treat neuronal problem, and then something like Neurantin. So, or Neurantin. That's medication that. Can control the nerve function, which is the same as gabapentin. And sometimes we use seizure medication. So that's what it means. All kind of everything that you have to target and even opiates, you have to attack every receptor that involves in pain. So anti-inflammatory, um, uh, uh, both the salicylic and no salicylic and NSAIDs. Um, you use a TCA with antidepressant medication. Uh, uh, neuropathic pain, you got to treat the neuropathic pain, which is gabapentin or neurontin, and then seizure medication and opiate medication. So if they give you a SATA question, all of them can be used to treat a patient with this kind of problem. This is the same uh, treatment you use for fibro. I'm just diverting, but fibro, in case you see it, fibro, fibromyalgia. That's the same thing you use for fibromyalgia. You got to do multimodal pain medication. So somebody will ask, what is the best treatment for trigeminal neuralgia? Well, you can use all of this, but the best pain medication is carbamazepine. I want you to know this, carbamazepine. This is a seizure medication. We use it for seizures, to control somebody's seizures. Um, it, it's different from dilantin. So carbamazepine. Once again, the treatment for trigeminal neuralgia, the best one is carbamazepine. It is a seizure medication. And that is very effective. The problem with this is this has a couple of side effects, okay? It, um, and you have to be careful. It is a, a sulfur drug. So you see what I'm leading to, sulfur drug. So what do you tell the patient? Well, sulfur drug causes photo sensitivity. So when you're going outside, teach them to wear some clothes, to cover them, they should wear hats hat sun, prevent sun exposure. They can have severe form of photosensitivity. They usually will develop a rash and popular rash. It's not just photosensitivity. That is Stephen John's syndrome. Stevie John syndrome. This is a priority patient. If you see somebody on carbamazepine, and they have rash, pop-like rash on their body, is Steven John syndrome. And the worst one is this, a granulo, a granulocytosis. So 
So it causes a granulocytosis, decrease your neutrophil level. You became neutropenic. So carbamazepine causes a granulocytosis. That's what they will ask you. When you give this pain, medic this pain medication to this patient, you have to watch for this. And what do you watch for? If he come in and said, I have cold, yeah, don't say, go take some Tylenol. That is a priority. If you say, oh, I have a low-grade fever, low-grade fever, that's a priority. If they say they're having diarrhea and they, they, they feel like they're getting UR symptoms, yeah. Upper respiratory infection or in diarrhea, well, that is any signs of infection is a priority. You need to call the doctor, intervene right now. They will go into sepsis because of a granulocytosis that become a B sharp issue. So sepsis on my B sharp. So you should call the doctor, sepsis, sepsis. So anybody who have trigeminal neuralgia on carbamazepine, you should watch for a granulocytosis. And if they describe some cold, low grade fever. So that's a, a, a priority patient. It's not an expected finding. You should call the doctor. They will complain of just cold, low-grade fever, some URI symptoms, you should call and stop the medication. You have to intervene right away. Otherwise, they go into sepsis. And uh, the other way they can ask you is what? What will you do? Well, I'll check the uh, frequent lab work, frequent CBC, so that I can check their neutrophil, check for their neutrophils. You, they will need frequent lab work um, so, and you can monitor them for signs and symptoms of infection or you can check frequent lab work. Okay, so this is all they can ask you on trigeminal neuralgia, your pain medication, what did the treatment and the trigger. And then um, finally, the other testable one they ask, is the cranial nerve five, A7. So cranial nerve seven, which is um, the facial nerve, it has both sensory and then uh, motor function. Um, we talk about it's involving facial expression. And, and then so patient um, will have symptoms due to that problem. This one too is an acute problem, it happened. It happened right away. And sometimes it happened right after viral illness. So if you have some you know, flu-like symptoms, it will happen. Um, most of the time, we don't know the etiology, so idiopathic. And usually one side. Most of the cranial nerves, everything, everybody, all of them mostly when you have it, is usually one-sided problem. So acute problem after viral illness, sometimes you nothing happened, then it happened, you've not done anything, and usually one side. Um, and um, patient will have palsy of the cranial nerve seven. All it means is this function of the cranial nerve seven. So for you to be able to know what symptoms they will show, go back to pathophysiology. This is involving facial expression. Okay, it's involving not sensation, but facial expression. Okay, and some sense, hey, uh, facial expression, uh, no facial sensation for facial expression and some sensation in your in your mouth. And so, what do you what do you do? Okay, patient. If they yeah, if this problem, how would you think they will they will present? Where the affected side will show signs that is not normal. Okay. 
and your facial nerve, it, it help you close your eyes. So they will not be able to close their eyes. So eye closure problem, no, they can't close their eyes because the high lead cannot come down and close their eyes. Okay, um, they will have, um, they, they, there will be decreased secretion. It also involve in secretion of the tears. So there will be decreased secretion of tears on the affected side. Because it involve in expression, when you move your face, all the side of your face, and you, you see that your lips and one side of your jaw, the muscles over there um, involve in facial, if the facial nerve is involved. So when you chew in, that side doesn't move. So it will drill, drilling. So that's why they will drill, drilling, um, drilling, and then stoop, and food will just run on their side of their face because that side is not moving. If it's involving facial expression, well, your smile will be affected. No smile. Would you think they will be able to frown? No. It's like they have Botox. I see facial nerve as like having a Botox injection. Think about it. Nothing moving your face. No Botox injection. And think that's the way I see them in the patient. If you give, give you a picture, that's what it will look like. That face doesn't move at all when they smile. And one side is the only thing that is more moving. So they won't frown on that side. No smile on that side. So like they've had Botox injection on that side. And then the it's involved in taste, um, like I told you, sensation of the oral mouth. So the outside of that uh, mouth will lack taste. So they won't be able to taste well. Um, and this is what's usually affected. You know, it, um, you can see I've given you a starter question, and if I'm the examiner. I will combine this with the cranial nerve and five, and I, I can put the symptoms together because they are on the face and I can confuse you. And so this is what you see when somebody have bell palsy. And so that's what they present. Acute onset, a viral illness, idiopathic, you don't know, or one side, and then they can't close their eyes. They have no, it can be the lack of tears on the other side, they have drooling on that side of the mouth, okay? So the mouth is drooling on the other side. They can't smile, they can't frown, they can't taste on the other side. They look like a shock, a stroke patient, okay? They look like stroke patient. Um, but so you gotta make sure this is not just stroke, but this is a bell palsy. How do you treat it? Well, So how do you treat it? I've told you, based on the causes, we just target it. Most of the time, you don't know what causes it, but sometimes um, after viral infection, so we use antiviral medication. If they give you multiple choice, answer choice, and you don't know what it is, look for V-I-R, at the last name. Most antivirals are V-I, V-I. So look for the answer choice, and that means it's a, um, antivirals. Example is like a cyclo, cyclo V-I. And you can use it to treat um, um, Bell palsy or um, valocycle VA. They all have this last name, VA. Look for last name VA, and that is antiviral. The other treatment is this patient will need steroid. So steroid to prevent the inflammation um, and to, and sometimes they will need NSAIDs in addition. So NSAID, steroid, and then anti-inflammatory uh, to help um, with the disease. More inside is not that too important, so I won't worry too much about it. But it's antivirals, steroid, and supportive care. Okay, supportive care so that you can 
And, and this will take sometimes six months, but they should see effect like two weeks. Two weeks, they should, between two to four weeks, they should see the gradual improvement. It's a gradual improvement. The disease isn't acute, but gradual improvement, their symptoms will improve. Their symptoms will improve. So, um, What do you do now? Based on what I've taught you, think about how you're going to teach this patient. What do they need to do? The teach the teaching is this is is all based on symptoms presentation. How they're going to present. So so the teaching which they will ask you or education. It's all based on this. I'm going to do the same thing I did with trigeminal neuralgia. Okay. I can close my eyes. Well, something is going to go into your eyes and you're going to injure your eyes. Your eyelid uh, cannot close so that, yeah, move so that you can close your eyes. So on the affected side, there's a problem. So what do you tell this patient? Well, you got to protect themselves. So they wear glasses. Let them wear glasses during the day. And when they go and sleep, well, they still have to protect their eyes. Because they are asleep, they don't need to see too much. They can patch it, patch the other eye, or they can wear shade. OK. Now, what happened? They don't. They cannot make tears. Tears is decreased on that side of the eye, so you can use artificial tears so that it can dry. Okay, if you're drooling on that side of the mouth, where put the food on the other side, unaffected. So if the right side is affected, put the food on the left side. If you're going to draw, you have drooling of food where you should eat food that will not make you draw. You have a lot of drooling. And what would, be, would that be? Soft, soft diet. This will be easy to chew. So chewing soft diet will make it easy to chew. And where would you chew? On affected side. Of course, they got to take care of their mouth. So good, good oral hygiene. Oral hygiene is never a bad thing. If you see it in your answer choices, anything oral hygiene is good. It improve your taste. Right? So this is, you see what I've done? Signs and symptoms converted it into teaching. Eye closure, well, wear glasses, during the day and patch in the evening. Decreased here, have artificial tears available. If you're drooling on your mouth on the side that is affected, put the food on the other side. If you can, um, and then to prevent that, well, use the soft food so that you don't drool. The, that side the, um, is going to be a problem, though, so chew food on, the, on an affected side. You put it on the other side because otherwise the food will come out. It's not because you got to move the teeth but when you put it there, it will come out from your mouth. And then, then you ensure good hygiene. And this is what you need to know about um, bell palsy. It's not stroke, it's an acute, anti some viral problem or idiopathic. It's one side of the face that is affected. The other side, so you can smile on the other side, but that side is affected, it's not. And the best way to remember is your, you injected Botox on one side of the face and leave the other side unaffected. Well, when you smile, the side without the Botox will move, where the other side will not move. And then to remember, know the functions, the facial nerve involved in facial expression and taste. And therefore, and specifically high move, your eye movement. And based on the symptoms, I can provide some teaching and treatment. Common treatment is steroids and antiviral. 
And then to remember Antavaro is looking for VR at the last name, VR. So this is all you need to know. I hope I make it easy for you. And then we'll just tackle some few questions just to apply our knowledge. So Ernest assess a client with prenatal nerve, what? Five, policy. What test should you do? This is application question, okay? Even though it's straightforward, it requires you to apply. If you know it, you don't, but you, there's some form of application. So cranial nerve five. I need to know every cranial nerve here to be able to eliminate. So I'll go one and see if it matches. My answer choice have to match cranial nerve five. A client, ask client to shred the shoulder. You know shredding the shoulder is a cranial nerve what? 11. Ask client to say, ah, well, that's cranial nerve nine. Ask client to read this now chat. I told you that that one is a visual acuity, so that's two. Ask client to smile. Smiling is cranial nerve seven. Ask client to identify touch of the face and the eyes and with the eyes closed. Yes, sensation of the face. Sensation of the face is five, but movement of the face is seven. Be careful, they like tricking you. Movement of the face is seven, but sensation is five. So this answer is right. So, you know, I'm a startup guy, so, and using pathophysiology. So one for you. And next receives a start order to assess a client eyes movement after penetrating injury. So patient had a penetrating injury. So the nurse, they, they receive an order to assess the patient, the movement of the eyes. Which nerves or nerve should you assess? So I told you if this is your eyes, okay. There's three nerves. One look like that. You move, you move the eyeball this way. The other one, let it look down. Right? And the other one, let it move in different direction and help with your pupil uh, reflex. And so there's three of them. We can find them. One, we know this is all factory, wrong. We know this is 10, Vegas, wrong. Three is the one that move the eye downward, the eyeball. Four, move, move the eyes laterally, right? And seven, we just talk about it. Trigeminal neuralgia is what? No, uh, bell palsy. So this is bell palsy. That's not, it move the eyelid, okay? That's not high movement because the eyelid is all muscle outside the eyes. It's just protecting the eyes. That's why when you have um, bell palsy, they, they need to cover the eyes and have a, something to um, artificial tear, tears to dry because the, the, the eyes will be there, um, but the, the lid cannot put it down. So it's the movement of the eyelid that is controlled by creating an F7. So it's not part of it. And then, oh, sorry, this is six. Sorry, this is six. So yeah, this is this is six. So this is our um, this is the one that moved the eyes um, laterally. And then two is for is the optic nerve, and this is doing the snail test, snail test, um, and then. This is six. Oh yeah, sorry, seven. Yeah, I can see. So this is six. This is seven. Seven. Yeah, that's greater than seven. The six is down where yeah. I forgot. I'm mixing my <laughs> Roman numerals. So this is six. This is the abducens. This is what move the eyes, um, laterally. So 
E is creating an F7. I was right. So that is the yeah, movement of the eyelid. So basically, it's, um, those nerves are three, four, and six. So this is three, four, and six. So those are the cranial issues to assess. So this is um, another question. A client with a temporal bone fracture found to have vestibular cochlear dysfunction. What prescription should the nurse expect from the ACP? So we know vestibular cochlear function is cranial nerve eight. All this is asking you, how will you test for cranial nerve eight? We know it's involved in what? Balance and hearing. So any test that do that is our answer. Gag reflex, reflex is cranial nerve nine. Test is seven, it's one of them. Assess client tongue movement is 12. So you left with this. I did it by eliminating, therefore with that. How do you test somebody balance? Well, use rhomboid, heel to shin, um, shin to toe, heel to toe, let them close their eyes and then uh, um, put their, their hand on their, their side and see if they're going to fall. Um, and then let them touch to your in your finger and touch it to your uh, your nose as you move it. So that's how you can test balance. And finally, one last one. It's a SATA question. Which of the following the nurse should expect? So read the last question, then go. I'm looking for what is unexpected. A client was diagnosed with what? Bell palsy after viral illness. So I know he has bell palsy after viral illness. What is expected? I told you how to do such a question. Write the keywords. Expected finding viral illness and bell palsy. So I have three things I need to worry about. I evaluate each question with this. I'll make a decision and never move until I make a decision. The way I see such a question is one answer choice for one question. So you prevent, pretend there's no B to G. You just cover them in your eyes. You said, I only have one answer for this question. That is easy. All right, it's 50-50. So I need to look at it. And then the best way to improve my chance is to satisfy all the three requirements. So bear policy, um, viral illness, and I'm looking expected. Prescription of carbamazepine. I know bell palsy, you use steroid and antiviral. Why would I have to give them seizure medication? Yeah, this is trigeminal neuralgia. Complete resolution of symptoms after a few months. Yeah, this is a viral illness, it's acute, it's idiopathic. Well, it will go away easily. Prescription. Oh, I forget to add something there. F prescription of antiviral, I'll put it there. Yeah, that is what is expected. So prescription for antiviral, uh, which is what you do for bell palsy. Wearing a patch at night. Yes, the eyelid cannot move. Um, the eyes is exposed, is at risk for injury. So they wear a patch at night. Prescription for soft diet, because of the side of the where the pulse is, they cannot, they have drool and they cannot close the mouth well. Food leaves out of their mouth, so you give them soft diet. Drooling on the affected side, yes. Unable to feel the affected side of the face. This is a tricky one. Unable to feel the affected side of the face. I told you the Facial nerve is involved in the movement of the face and the sensation is in the mouth, the taste. But cranial nerve five, trigeminal, is involved in sensation of the face. That's why 
when you massage your face, when you have trigeminal neuralgia, you have pain. And therefore, this is a tricky one. This is wrong. So this is a summary of um, what you need to know. And then I try to make it easy for you as much as I can. Uh, but you can see what I've done. I've put everything together. I know this is very intimidating, but you can make it easy. Try to stay within your focus on it and have a, a pathophysiological understanding of the problem and you can use it to solve it. Once again, thank you for listening um, and keep charging. And then vis if you like this video, visit um, my YouTube channel, Adapt Enclose, and then like it and put some comment for new videos that you like. Take care of yourself. All the best of luck.